Okay, I'm here to talk about Internet of Things, or Internet of all the things, or Internet of everything. Uh, different vendors and different analysts have different um, ideologies about what it means. Um, it could mean anything. There are so many things um, that we are expecting to take advantage of um, that are going to be connected to the Internet. But the question that I want to pose is, uh, today is, what, what does the Internet of Things mean? What does it mean for you? And an online publication actually posed this question a while back um, and said, if you were going to explain the Internet of Things to uh, a child, um, how would you do it? And I was really fascinated by this because um, there were a variety of answers that came back. Um, and a lot of them were still mired in jargon and tech. Um, a lot of people talked about uh, transmitters and RFID uh, things, tags and, and communication protocols and stuff. And I'm thinking, uh, is that really how we talk to our children? How are we going to explain it? And this, this example really sort of uh, highlighted uh, the simplicity of, uh, of uh, what we should be thinking about with the Internet of Things. And, uh, and I really like the last line, which is, imagine if your toys could speak to one another. Um, and that's exactly what it is. It's boiled down to its simplest fact is these are things that are going to be communicating to each other and to us. We should never forget the human element in all of this. So what do these things look like? Well, people are coming up with smart forks, for example, to uh, uh, track how many calories you eat and berate you when you uh, eat too much chocolate cake. Then there's a, there's a smart toothbrush that will actually communicate with a smart fork and actually moan at you when you're not brushing your teeth after you've eaten too much chocolate. Um, we have smart fridges that were alluded to uh, earlier, which actually track what you're eating and uh, will order food um, again. And we now have smart um, washing machines from Samsung, which you can control with your um, mobile phone. Um, and in the next software update, I'm, I'm reliably told that um, you'll be able to bung in your uh, dirty clothes. Um, and while you're heading out the door, your uh, washing machine is actually going to text you uh, and say, what the hell were you up to last night? I've seen no stains. Um, okay, so I promised not to talk too much about numbers, but I'm going to talk on it. I mean, let's, let's be honest, we don't want a too smart a washing machine, but we're quite fortunate just now because only 99% of the uh, available toys that we have right now um, aren't actually connected to the Internet today. Um, when you think about the things that are in your home, um, they weren't manufactured. They weren't manufactured to take advantage of this trend, which is literally going to blow the minds of everyone on this planet. Um, how many are we talking about? Well, we've seen a figure from Cisco, um, which was 32 or 34, I think. Uh, originally, Cisco came up with 50 billion. Uh, last year, I actually stood on this stage, uh, this very stage in October for uh, GovTech, um, and Morgan Stanley at that time had come out with uh, 75 billion. Gartner is starting to come down a little bit and be a little bit more conservative and say there are going to be 50 billion toys um, connected by the year 2020. So that's a very small window um, to, to increase the amount of uh, 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 toys from 99% that aren't connected to 25 billion that are going to be connected. And what does this mean for you guys in the audience, both as vendors, as businesses, and as data scientists and people who are interested in data? Well, it's a $19 trillion opportunity. And this isn't just about sales, and this isn't about hardware sales and software sales and platforms and things like that. This is actually business opportunity in terms of taking advantage of the information that the data uh, coming from the, uh, the, these uh, variety of things and improving your business beyond measure. Things uh, reinventing how your business operates, your operating models, your systems integrated, um, all the information that you can actually take advantage of to reinvigorate how your business works, the efficiencies that you can gain. There'll be an example later on that I can show you. And the point that I really want you to take away from this um, is the Internet of Things is not about the Internet and it's not about the things themselves. It is about the data. It's the information that you need to harness um, to take advantage of this. So I'm going to paint an extreme example here which could actually become a reality in the next few years. So imagine if you are actually going into hospital for a hip operation. Not hip hop, but hip. Um, or you could be hip. Um, so a hip operation, um, right now you get a plastic hip, it's fairly generic, it's fairly boring, um, it doesn't do anything. In the next few years, there are going to be 3D printing um, organs. It's no stretch of the imagination that you can walk into a hospital for an operation and they will 3D print from a scan um, a hip there and then before the actual operation itself. And this hip will be embedded with sensors, so you will become part of the Internet of Things. 
So you're in hospital and your uh, surgeon is going to be wearing some kind of wearable device that tracks what goes on in the surgery itself. So he's going to be filming it as it happens and that's going to be relaying information to your medical records in real time at the hospital. Um, and of course you've got this uh, new brand new 3D printed hip that fits you like a glove and it's already starting to work. It's picking up your biometrical readings, it's reading your heart rate, your blood pressure, um, your movement, uh, whether uh, the medications are working for pain relief, that kind of sort of thing. And you're going to be taking advantage of this in, uh, in, in a wearable device like a, a Jawbone Up for example or a Fitbit because um, that will be transmitting to you and you want to actually track this. And because that is already tied to your um, your smartphone itself, then your doctor will be getting this relayed in real time as well. Your doctor's surgery will be getting uh, the information about your recovery, and your doctor might be able to tweak your recovery plan um, as you are going along. Um, and it's not just you that's received this hip. There'll be maybe 200, 300 other people um, across the world or across that particular region that might have received um, a hip operation. Um, and that data will be uh, collected, aggregated, correlated, and you will be plotted against a, a median chart, for example. And maybe you're actually doing something that is affecting your recovery rate a lot faster than other people, and that will be taken into account. And there will be doctors ev everywhere else who will be tweaking their patients' plans according to how you are actually recovering. Yeah, and you're getting cabin fever in your house, you've been told to stay put, you actually really want to rip up the roads in your Prius. Um, <laughs> But your Prius is connected, um, and there's no, um, there's no limit to this. So your Prius could actually pick up signals from your jawbone, which actually say, do you know what, you're only allowed to drive uh, an hour a day at this precise moment in time. So you could actually be prevented from driving your car. Um, you're out and about in your car, you want to come home soon, it's coming up to that hour before you turn it into a pumpkin, so of course your car is geofenced, it could communicate to your devices at home so it could switch on the lights, turn on the heating that's been advised for you, um, and there's no point in having a smart home if your utility company is dumb, so your utilities company will actually be billing you um, per device that's attached to your home. Um, it's not going to be a flat fee basis, it's not going to be just by general energy consumption, it will be tracked by uh, each individual device, and this is supposed to lead us to a better life, that's the promise. So what does this really mean though? Well it means we have to turn all that data that's been generated by uh, the Internet of Things, by all these things and devices, into insight and then into action, and for a business that's the most important part. Um, it's, it's making sense of all that information and as data scientists in the audience and all the analytics and things like that, um, you can actually use that for predictive maintenance capabilities, predicting what's going to happen next, making more informed uh, business decisions about your business, um, efficiency gains, and who's, um, who's familiar with this? It's Deming's um, old um, project methodology, which is plan, do, check, and act. The Internet of Things has got something similar, similar cycle, which is devi devices, data, insight, and action. And again, this is something that you need to take away. Not only is it the data that's driving it, but it's actually the steps that we need to go through to actually make sense of that data and actually turn it into an actionable. So what are the realities? What have I seen around the world? Um, that actually works for the Internet of Things. And I know we've had uh, a few myths debunked um, today, but there are actually things um, happening. So um, a few years back, uh, a United States um, local authority asked uh, MIT students to help them understand the supply chain um, for uh, recycling rubbish. They had wanted to do some uh, process re-engineering, actually get a handle on the cost involved uh, running this process. And what they did was the MIT students asked 2,000 people in this um, uh, constituency to tag uh, recyclable rubbish as they threw it out. And from 2,000 traces with little RFID tags, it got under a little under uh, 1,200 traces. And the average length that a piece of rubbish traveled was 114 kilometers. Um, the longest trace that came back was from a $10 printer cartridge, which traveled 6,000 kilometers. Um, and uh, that was actually the end of the signal itself. It actually entered an airfield, um, and it, uh, more likely it actually boarded a plane and went somewhere else. So that journey was never re fully recorded. Um, so that in itself, from the sensor data, it wasn't enough. You couldn't really sort of re-engineer a process and understand how much it was costing. So what they did was they took into account all the factors involved to actually run that process. So we're looking at petrol costs, uh, road, road maintenance, 
Um, vehicle maintenance, these things are big heavy machines. Um, people costs, carbon footprint as well. And they averaged out at $5 a kilometer to transport waste. Now, if you're paying tax, um, there is absolutely no way that you will want to pay $30,000 to recycle a $10 printer cartridge. So, of course, they didn't know that at the time. They never had that information before, but using methods attached to the Internet of Things, they were able to re-engineer the process from back to front and the entire supply chain. Who's seen the film Rush? Rush is brilliant. I'm a great motorsport fan. Um, Back in the day in Formula One, uh, they didn't have anything electronic, nothing at all. It was all mechanical, they had nothing to track. And only a few years ago, uh, Porsche were still using spreadsheets. They had 60 people looking at spreadsheets um, during a race, um, but all the analysis was done after it. And then would, all the correlation and the data and the insight was then applied to the next race. You couldn't actually do it in the race itself. Now it's a completely different thing because of the sensors in the car and the sensors attached to the actual driver as well, it's generating so much information they can actually tweak um, race performance um, per lap. Uh, Lotus have a mission at the moment to actually shave off something like a second a lap. Um, every time they do a race with the information that's generated, you can actually predict the failure of uh, mechanical items in the car itself. Um, and this is, and again, the uh, stress levels of the uh, uh, drivers are actually being uh, wired and used in conjunction with the actual car data as well. Who wears a, a wearable here? Jawbone or Fitbit? Nobody's fit here. That's quite. <laughs> um, so wearable devices, it gives us um, uh, an amazing amount of quantifiable information, so it's the quantified uh, society um, about ourselves. But businesses, as a business, you can actually use that, and Aperio did that um, recently this year. It was reported that they gave their 1,000 employees um, Fitbit bands um, to track how their movement, to track their health, um, and they allowed uh, the uh, employees to actually um, upload that information um, to the cloud, uh, opened up chat rooms to actually discuss uh, fitness plans, healthy eating, all that kind of sort of thing. Um, and then they mined that information and gave it to the health insurance company. And they've actually saved nearly $300,000 on their annual health um, by proving that their workforce is active, is healthy. And that's something, you know, as a business, if there are business owners here, it doesn't matter how small or how large they are, um, you should be thinking about um, to take advantage of. I mean, if that's 1,000 employees generating $300,000 uh, worth of savings, imagine something for, uh, in an operation like SAP with like 70,000 employees. You know, that's a big saving, and you haven't actually had to do anything special for it. There's no re-engineering of processes. There's no massive project that takes 12 years or something like that. This is a very instantaneous result. So who suffers road rage and parking rage? I see um, uh, parking is a bit of a problem in uh, Cape Town. Um, so to help that, what uh, San Francisco did, for example, was they actually enabled uh, nearly 20,000 um, parking spaces with uh, the embedded sensors. And those sensors uh, detected whether or not a parking space was open or closed, or it was full, I should say. And that was tied to an app and some analytics uh, tied to the back. So it allowed people to book a parking space in advance and it would pay a particular premium depending on the availability of spaces um, and the time of day. Um, and that reduced a lot of traffic on the road because you didn't have to plan three hours in advance to go drive into the city, spend two hours driving around trying to find a space. The space was there at the time that you wanted it. Um, and that removed cars from the road, it removed carbon footprint, and actually public safety was improved. There was a perception that the public and pedestrians felt safe, and that was good for San Francisco. These large earth-moving machines, someone has to build these. They don't just pop out of nowhere. Caterpillar actually have huge manufacturing plants, and they've um, uh, implemented uh, predictive analytics systems tied to the machines and the robots that make these. So the m robot data and the machine data that's coming out of these factories allow them to predict in advance when something is going wrong, and they can schedule maintenance in, in advance. Now, if you think if a robot breaks down and you're not expecting it, 
Um, the whole plant shuts down. You can't actually make one of these things. It's not a simple operation to swap in and swap out. But if you can schedule something in advance, you can actually plan in advance which components can be made in the meantime while this machine is down. And they saved something like 70% operational cost in terms of downtime by implementing something based on the, the Internet of Things methodology. And this one is a bit of a quirky one, actually. It's a retail example where we have smart hangers. We actually have hangers communicating to the internet and picking up li Facebook likes um, according to the, uh, what's actually uh, hanging on the, on the rack. So what they did was this uh, retailer actually projected uh, Facebook likes per particular item of clothing. And what they found was that they could actually uh, stock take and predict stock uh, much more accurately. And it actually influenced buyer behavior. If you were going in for a shirt, and you fancied a couple of shirts, you would actually be more likely to buy the one that had 10,000 Facebook likes than the one that had four. And they were actually able to use that and mine that information to basically predict stock, predict stock levels um, and take away stock that weren't actually um, selling. So again, some more concrete examples. Uh, GE turbines, GE is probably one of the biggest uh, proponents of uh, the Internet of Things. The uh, gas turbines generate 500 gigabytes um, of data a day, and they use that to increase the efficiency. 500 grand um, worth of annual savings per turbine. That's not across, that's per turbine. And think how many turbines there are in the world that generate power and electricity. Smart cities. If you implement smart things um, across the city for uh, lighting control, for example, the um, city of Oslo has uh, uh, reduced uh, their bills by 62%. And connected hospitals, like the uh, healthcare example that I gave before, a reduction of 51 minutes for bed turnaround at St. Luke's Medical Center. And Gartner has come out with uh, four IoT usage models at their recent symposium. And again, we've touched on these already. Um, asset monitoring and optimization, predictive maintenance, Pay as you use is going to be really, really important. That's something if there's any utilities companies here or service providers, that is really going to be something that you're going to have to take advantage of and prepare for because consumers will demand it. And I'll just leave you with this. It's a bit of a quirky cartoon, but I mean, that's consumers. This is the kind of sort of thing that we might be seeing very, very soon. Uh, we're sitting at our desks and our things at home. Gartner says that there's going to be 500 different um, well, 500 items in our home that are going to be connected and smart um, on the internet um, by 2020. You might be getting a text message, like I say, from your smart fridge or whatever, saying, you know, something's happening. You've got to, <laughs> and here's uh, here's some suggested actions for you. Thank you.